Dr. Doug Rocky is a depleted uranium expert. He earned his BS in physics at Western Illinois University, followed by his MS and PhD in physics and technology education at the University of Illinois. His military career has spanned four decades to include combat duty during the Vietnam War and Gulf War I. Doug served as a member of the 3rd U.S. Army Medical Command's Nuclear Biological Chemical MBC Teaching Medical Response and Special Operations Team, 3rd U.S. Army Captured Equipment Project Team, and with the 3rd U.S. Army Depleted Uranium Assessment Team during uh, Desert uh, War One, Operation Desert Storm. And he wrote then in the official book on it, on DU. He literally wrote, we got the guy who wrote the book, wrote the book for you. Because now troops are calling me going, they say there's no problem. We can bomb an area and go right into it. They say do use no problem. And they're just using it everywhere now. He was the U.S. Army's depleted uranium project director from 94 to 95, the Army's director of the program. He developed the congressionally mandated education training materials that aren't given to anyone now and wrote the U.S. Army regulation 700-48, just like there's regulations on radiation, on, on, on radiology equipment, x-ray machines, the government doesn't have to follow it. And they call in TSA workers now. We've confirmed this. We've had callers tell us, but I've confirmed it separately and are asking them, do you have a problem with these? Are you worried about them? Do you worry about radiation? Yeah, I'm worried. Okay, you're let go. We'll find an idiot that'll do it. He wrote the U.S. Army Regulation 700-48, U.S. Army PAM 700-48, and U.S. Army's Common Task for DU Incidents. Doug has taught nuclear, biological, chemical warfare, hazardous materials, emergency medicine for 20 years in both civil and military personnel. Dr. Doug Rocky was the original author of the 1982 EDRT Emergency Disaster Response Assistance Team proposal, which formed the formation of the today's National Guard CSD teams and the Illinois CERT teams. In preparation for the 96 Atlanta Olympics, he wrote and taught the original chemical, biological, counterterrorism course for the civilian emergency responders that is now the federal 120 cities and Department of Justice course that served as the emergency response team location at Birmingham, Alabama. He joins us now, uh, and he's been affected in bad health, and, and a lot of his team has died, by the way, just from the cleanup at the uh, road of death in 1991 outside Kuwait, uh, there on the Iraq border. And uh, he's still hanging on in a, in a, in a bull. And uh, Dr. Doug Rocky, good to have you here with us, sir. Well, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> you make me sound some kind of like, uh, hey, I'm just a guy with blue jeans and tennis shoes. Yeah, but, I mean, you are one of the leading experts on DU in the world. You ran the Army program. Yeah, and unfortunately, that was part of my tasking. And, you know, when we when we used this during Desert Storm, there were no preparations or anything put in place for medical care or environmental cleanup. And all of a sudden, General Schwarzkopf sent an order down to the 3rd Medical Can Command Commander, uh, D.G. Zulis, and said, hey, find Doug Rocky. You know, the Pentagon said he's the guy to do it and uh, have him clean up the mess and do decon and set up the medical care and... Uh, Lord Almighty, it's now been, what, 20 years. Talk about what it's done to you personally and what happened to your team. Oh, boy. Well, yeah, I mean, within 24 hours of the initial assignment, we all started coming down with respiratory problems and rashes. The first cancers on the team happened within six to nine months afterwards. The first deaths on the team were within two years. Uh, you'll see a lot of people in the Department of Defense, they'll say, no, it didn't happen. There's individuals out there today that try to stop all this information from getting out. They say it didn't happen. We weren't there. Well, we were there. The photographs, the video, all prove it. You know, one of the things that was real interesting in 1998, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, Secretary of Defense staff, you know, they all briefed him, all right? And they flat out told him, you know, eight years after the fact, they hadn't even notified anybody or set up medical care. So it's, it's, it goes on and on and on and on. And you on. wrote the book on what it does, but, I mean, tell us what, what it did to you personally. Well, what first happened, we got the rash and the respiratory stuff. Within two to three years, as I'm going back on active duty for as the director of the U.S. Army Depleted Radium Project to write the training, the regulations, the cleanup procedures. Uh, the kidney problems are already there. Had probably 20 kidney surgeries. The that's what the truth. Uh, that's what the troops keep telling me. It messes up their kidneys and, 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 and urinary tract. How many surgeries do you have, sir? About 20. 20. Okay. Please continue. And then we had all the respiratory problems: calcified granulomas in the lungs. Uh, the radiation cataracts, they've already had the eye surgery in the left eye, and they're trying to postpone the eye surgery in the right eye because the surgery is just a, a nightmare, and it takes months and months of recovery, of recovery and it's so dangerous. The uh, thing we've had happen, and again, I have more phone calls and emails on it again in the last 48 hours, is uh, because of decalcification and dephosphorization of the bones and the teeth. Uh, you fracture bones all over the place, and then your teeth just literally 
they disintegrate and fall out, and uh, so my teeth are gone. And then, uh, obviously, you have all the other neurological problems and neuromuscular problems, and we're seeing in hundreds of thousands of U.S. military, totally confirmed by the Department of Veteran Affairs with all the same problems. I mean, it has just turned into a complete nightmare. Uh, members of my team developed cancer and died. We had a friendly fire guy, absolute friendly fire, Desert Storm 1, in a Bradley fighting vehicle. They're still, to this day, I got the uh, message from him on, on, on the other day, okay? And he still was denied medical care after 20 years. 20 years that he was in a Bradley fighting vehicle where an Abrams gunner shot it up with a 120-millimeter DU round, he still can't get medical care. And then the widows of my guys that have died, they've just all but abandoned them. And now we just got numbers by the British Medical Journal and others, 14 times the regular cancer rate in Fallujah, three to four times in the troops that fought there. I mean, that is a nuclear war zone. And, and now they've gone from admitting DU's badge to just saying, everybody, have a party. It's fun. Well, you know, that was part of the thing, because what was really crazy, in March of 1991, uh, as I got this assigned to do all this stuff, I was given two memorandum, and you've seen these memorandum before. One was called the Los Alamos Memorandum. The other one was sent, and that was written by Colonel Michael Zeem from Los Alamos, New Mexico, the major labs there. And the other one was uh, written by Colonel Greg Lyle from the Defense Nuclear Agency. These are, these are the number one bomb guys, okay? You don't get any higher. Than these are the experts. And uh, in the Defense Nuclear Agency, it warned about all the serious health hazards, all the risks of political ramifications, the fact that we would deliberately contaminate air, water, and soil, leaving that contamination for eternity and can't be cleaned up. But then in the Los Alamos memo, we said direct order to lie on our reports to sustain the use of uranium munitions by maintaining active proponency. And then uh, in December of 1992, uh, we started the U.S. Army Environmental Policy Institute study on depleted uranium, and that was co-located here at the University of Illinois in the U.S. Army uh, Serial Labs. That's their main Army research lab. And in that directive from December 1992, it said, well, do the study, guys. We know it's a health hazard. We can't clean it up. There's nothing we can do about the medical or environmental effects, but, uh, hey, we're always going to use it. And uh, it's been going on that way ever since. And now they've got proving grounds. Before it was, what, 10? Now it's hundreds. They're using it in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Texas, near small towns. They're just, in fact, I've, I've been talking to armorers and others. They now serve it out to the troops and don't even tell them it's DU. Well, you know, one of the most interesting things about that, it's all over. We've got Kansas City as a mess. We've got uh, up and uh, all around New York, around uh, the Falls, Niagara Falls, that whole area is a mess. We've got Puerto Rico as a mess. We've got England, Florida as a mess. You know, the contamination is definitely out there in the Gulf. Now, what's been stirred up with all this current nightmare, I don't know. Hawaii has turned into a total mess. And the Army simply refuses to clean up Hawaii, even though they acknowledge it's there, even though the medical effects are known, and they simply refuse to clean it up. And then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just goes ahead and backs them up all the way. It, uh, I mean, we have to understand. We have to get rid of the byproduct of our, of our nuclear energy system, okay? So 99% of everything that goes into the system at uh, Paducah, Kentucky, Oak Ridge, and uh, Fort Smith, Ohio, to make reactor fuel or bomb stuff is pure waste. That's uranium hexafluoride. 99% by mass is pure waste. Well, what we do then, we turn it into concrete. We turn it into DU munitions. We turn it into forklift, forklift truck weights. We turn it into cooking pots and even golf club heads. I mean, it's really neat. Uh, now, 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 excuse me. I've read some of this, but they're now putting this in regular products. Oh, absolutely, because of the incredibly high density. I mean, if you think about a golf club head, what you want is incredible high density to hit that ball and drive that ball a long ways. So they do that. And then the forklift trucks, you need incredibly high density. So you have a small volume but extremely high weight. So it's used in the back. And then for concrete, it's called DU Creep. You can buy it at the lumber yard. And, again, what it does is strengthens and reinforce the concrete. You don't have to put the rebar in it because it's already got the metal in it. So, so that's actually true. This is sold at Home Depot. Probably. A different. I'm not, I, you know, I've never gone into Home Depot to buy it, but it's definitely sold on the market. I mean, you know, you can get it and it's worked with it. So we have all of this stuff, but then we continuously use these munitions because they're incredibly effective. Yeah, but let's first talk about the half-life of DU. What's well, <laughs> Billions and billions of years, forget it. I mean, you know, we have the rheological uh, part of it, okay? And, I mean, we're looking at billions and billions of years to reduce even one half-life. 
Now, when this stuff is laying outside on the ground, I mean, it's not a real hazard, but once it gets in the body, the alpha, beta, and gamma emissions literally tear up the body and rip up the body because they're in direct contact, and now you have incredible radiological damage once it's inhaled, ingested, absorbed, or anything. Well, by the way, Doc, we did pull it up. It's 4.5 billion years. Isn't that wonderful? And, and, and this shows the mindset of these people. They want a carbon tax on carbon dioxide that plants breathe, but they're not worried about DU everywhere. You know, one of the crazy things is, in preparation for Desert Storm, Colonel J. Edgar Wakayama, who is the director of the Operational Test and Evaluation Command for the whole Department of Defense, okay, he did a DU briefing. Now, he took a lot of the information I wrote and he put into it. And he totally confirmed all the health problems in it. I mean, when you pull up the actual briefing by him, the Pentagon briefing, thoroughly, thoroughly acknowledges alpha particle taken inside the body has large doses and hazard producing cell damage and can cell damage and cancer. Lung cancer is well documented. Well, that's what happened to my guys. The beta particle hazardous to skin and the lens of the eyes, incredible rashes. Uh, the damage to the lens of the eye, the radiation cataracts, again, has ripped my eyes apart. Uh, we look at all the continuing problems, all of the stuff, target ordinance, kidney, and the bone. And then when you got the bone, obviously you got the teeth, which just break out. And the other crazy thing, they totally acknowledge, statement of fact, urine samples containing uranium are mutagenic as determined by the Ames test. Well, ladies and gentlemen, don't pee on your fingers because you're putting direct carcinogens on your fingers. The culture stem, human stem cell bone line with DU also transforms the cells to become carcinogenic. Well, that's why we have all the incredible levels of leukemia. I mean, we have incredible levels of leukemia in the returning military troops and totally, as you just acknowledged, all over Iraq, Afghanistan, all over the place where it's been tested, up in Concord, Massachusetts, where we look at, at uh, Albany, New York, we look down in... Uh, Doc, I want to get more into that, but, but what does this mean for you about the mindset of the war planners? Because... You've quoted these from the late 1940s where they were already talking about this as a weapon because they had so much byproduct, but they said no. From the 40s up until the 80s, they said no. You know, they'd, they'd let the troops be in Agent Orange. They'd let the troops take guinea pig vaccines. They'd even have the Project Shad and spray chemical and biologicals on the troops, you know, treating them like guinea pigs. But then there was this change. It was just, I mean, that sounds like something Satan would do. We'll, we'll let the troops use a weapon. We'll put it in concrete. We'll put it in golf clubs. We'll put it in forklifts. We'll put it everywhere. It's going to soft kill everybody that gets in contact with it. I mean, something changed. And, and that dovetails with now high-powered x-rays that look through your walls, and they're telling the technicians, don't worry about radiation. I, I mean, this is madness. Well, it's not just that. I mean, you know, we've got the Buck Rogers ray gun, too, that the Air Force Secretary has authorized and told to use on civilians during any dis uh, any disturbances or protests or anything else. So we've got this out there totally. I think for me as a, you know, a career military officer, a scientist, a teacher and everything, and medical, you know, I had to come to the realization, especially when I was served as a director and did the stuff and wrote it. I came to the realization no matter what we did, you couldn't clean it up after you used it. No matter what you did, there was absolutely no effective medical care and treatment because as I'm doing this, I'm deteriorating. I mean, one of the most astonishing things that they said at the U.S. Army Chemical School is they called me uh, Dr. Rock or Dr. D.U. is, my God, how are you continuing to do all this work when you're so sick and your guys are so sick, and yet you guys are writing the regulations, you're doing the research on the Nevada test site, averaging proving grounds every place we were doing it, and yet you're getting this done. Well, I had to personally come to the realization, my God, what we have done to God's earth and what we are doing to God's earth and what we will do to God's earth is completely wrong. We can't use these radioactive toxic conditions because we can't clean them up. We don't have the medical care. And yet the arrogance that's set by the military mindset is any weapon that we have can kill and destroy man, animal, structures, or anything we're going to use.